The Road to Business Success by Andrew Carnegie was first published by Doubleday Page and Company in 1902. The original text is now in the public domain. However, this audiobook is not in the public domain. It is produced by Wealth Books. Copyright 2024. The Road to Business Success A Talk to Young Men, Lessons Drawn from a Long Business Career it is well known that young men should begin at the beginning and occupy the most subordinate positions. Many of the leading businessmen of Pittsburgh had a serious responsibility thrust upon them at the very threshold of their careers. They were introduced to the broom and spent the first hours of their business lives sweeping out of the office. I notice we have janitors and janitresses now in offices, and our young men unfortunately miss that salutary branch of a business education. But if, by chance, the professional sweeper is absent any morning, the boy who has the genius of a future partner in him will not hesitate to try his hand at the broom. The other day, a fond, fashionable mother in Michigan asked a young man whether he had ever seen a young lady sweep in a room so grandly as her Priscilla. He said no, he never had, and the mother was gratified beyond measure, but then said, after a pause, what I should like to see her do is sweep out a room. It does not hurt the newest comer to sweep out the office if necessary. I was one of those sweepers myself, and who do you suppose were my fellow sweepers? David McCargo, now superintendent of the Allegheny Valley Railroad, Robert Pitcame, superintendent of the Pennsylvania Railroad, and Mr. Moreland, city attorney. We all took turns. Two each morning did the sweeping, and now I remember Davy was so proud of his clean white shirt bosom that he used to spread over it an old silk bandana handkerchief, which he kept for the purpose, and we other boys thought he was putting on airs, so he was. None of us had a silk handkerchief. Assuming that you have all obtained employment and are fairly started, my advice to you is to aim high. I would not give a fig for the young man who does not already see himself as the partner or the head of an influential firm. Do not rest content for a moment in your thoughts as head clerk, foreman, or general manager in any concern, no matter how extensive. Say each to yourself, my place is at the top. Be king in your dreams. Make your vow that you will reach that position with an untarnished reputation and make no other vow to distract your attention except the very commendable one that when you are a member of the firm or before that, if you have been promoted two or three times, you will form another partnership, a partnership to which our new Partnership Act has no application. The liability there is never limited. Let me indicate two or three conditions essential to success. Do not be afraid that I am going to moralize you or inflict a homily on you. I speak on the subject only from the view of a man of the world, desirous of aiding you to become successful businessmen. You all know that there is no genuine, praiseworthy success in life if you are not honest, truthful, and fair-minded. I assume you are and will remain all these and also that you are determined to live pure, respectable lives, free from pernicious or equivocal associations with one sex or the other. There is no creditable future for anyone else. Otherwise, your learning and your advantages not only go for naught, but also serve to accentuate your failure and your disgrace. I hope you will not take it amiss if I warn you against three of the gravest dangers that will beset you on your upward path. The first and most seductive, and the destroyer of most young men, is the drinking of liquor. I am no temperance lecturer in disguise, but a man who knows and tells you what observation has proved to him, and I say to you that you are more likely to fail in your career from acquiring the habit of drinking liquor than from any or all the other temptations likely to assail you. You may yield to almost any other temptation and reform. You may brace up 
and if not recover lost ground, at least remain in the race and secure and maintain a respectable position. But with the insane thirst for liquor, escape is almost impossible. I have known but few exceptions to this rule. First then, you must not drink liquor in excess. It is better if you do not touch it at all, much better. But if this is too much of a rule for you, then take your stand firmly here. Resolve never to touch it except at meals. A glass of liquor at dinner will not hinder your advancement in life or lower your tone, but I implore you to hold it inconsistent with the dignity and self-respect of gentlemen, with what is due from yourselves to yourselves, being the men you are and especially the men you are determined to become, to drink a glass of liquor at a bar. Be far too much of a gentleman to enter a bar room. You do not pursue your career in safety unless you stand firmly on this ground, adhere to it, and you have escaped danger from the deadliest of your foes. The next greatest danger to a young businessman in this community, I believe, is that of speculation. When I was a telegraph operator here, we had no exchanges in the city, but the men or firms who speculated on the eastern exchanges were certainly known to the operators. They could be counted on the fingers of one hand. These men were not our citizens of first repute. They were regarded with suspicion. I have lived to see all of these speculators irreparably ruin men, bankrupt in money and bankrupt in character. There is scarcely an instance of a man who has made a fort by speculation and kept it. Gamesters die poor, and there is certainly not an instance of a speculator who has lived a life creditable to himself or advantageous to the community. The man who reads the morning paper first sees how his speculative ventures on the exchanges are likely to result in a limit to himself for the calm consideration and proper solution of business problems with which he has to deal later in the day and saps the sources of that persistent and concentrated energy upon which depends the permanent success and often the very safety of his main business. The speculator and the businessman tread divergent lines. The former depends upon the sudden turn of time's wheel. He is a millionaire today and a bankrupt tomorrow. But the man of business knows that only through years of patience and devoted attention to affairs can he earn his reward, which is the result, not of chance, but of well-devised means for the attainment of ends. During all these years, there has been the cheering thought that there is no possibility that he can benefit himself without bringing prosperity to others. The speculator, on the other hand, had better never have lived so far as the good of others or the good of the community is concerned. Hundreds of young men were tempted in this city not long ago to gamble in oil, and many were ruined. All were injured, whether they lost or won. You may indeed be certain to be similarly tempted, but when so tempted, I hope you will remember this advice. Say to the tempter who asks you to risk your small savings that, if ever you decide to speculate, you are determined to go to a regular and well-conducted house where they cheat fairly. You can get fair play and about an equal chance upon the red and black in such a place. Upon the exchange, you have neither. You might as well try your luck with the three-card Monty man. There is another point involved in speculation. Nothing is more essential to young businessmen than untarnished credit. Credit begotten of confidence in their prudence, principles, and stability of character. Well, believe me, nothing kills credit sooner on any bank board than the knowledge that either firms or men engage in speculation. It matters not a whit whether gains or losses are the temporary result of these operations. The moment a man is known to speculate, his credit is impaired, and soon thereafter it is gone. How can a man be credited whose resources may be swept away in one hour by a panic among gamers? Who can tell how he stands among them, except that this is certain? He has given due notice that he may stand to lose all, so that those who credit him have themselves to blame. Resolve to be businessmen, but speculators never. The third and last danger against which I shall warn you is one that has wrecked many a fair craft that started
It is the perilous habit of endorsing all the more dangerous, inasmuch as it assails one generally in the garb of friendship. It appeals to your generous instincts, and you say, how can I refuse to lend my name only to assist a friend? It is because there is so much that is true and commendable in that view that the practice is so dangerous. Let me endeavor to put you in safe, honorable company with regard to it. I would say to you to make it a rule now, never endorse, but this is too much, like never taste wine, never smoke, or any other of the nevers. They generally result in exceptions. You will now, as businessmen, probably become security for friends. Now, here is the line at which regard for the success of friends should cease and regard for your own honor begins. If you owe anything, all your capital and all your effects are a solemn trust in your hands, to be held inviolate for the security of those who have trusted you. Nothing can be done by you with honor, which jeopardizes these first claims against you. When a man in debt endorses another, it is not his own credit or his own capital he risks. It is that of his own creditors. He violates a trust. Mark you then, never endorse until you have cash means not required for your own debts, and never endorse beyond those means. Before you endorse at all, consider endorsements as gifts, and ask yourselves whether you wish to make the gift to your friend and whether the money is really yours to give and not a trust for your creditors. You are not safe, gentlemen unless you stand firmly upon this as the only ground that an honest businessman can occupy. I beseech you to avoid liquor, speculation, and endorsement. Do not fail in either, for liquor and speculation are the Scylla and Charybdis of the young man's business sea, and endorse his rock ahead. Assuming you are safe in regard to these your gravest dangers, the question now is how to rise from the subordinate position we have imagined you in, through the successive grades, to the position for which you are, in my opinion, and, I trust, in your own, evidently intended. I can give you the secret. It lies mainly in this. Instead of the question, what must I do for my employer? Substitute, what can I do? Faithful and conscientious discharge of the duties as signed by you is all very well, but the verdict in such cases generally is that you perform your present duties so well that you had better continue performing them. Now, young gentlemen, this will not do. It will not do for the coming partners. There must be something beyond this. We make clerks, bookkeepers, treasurers, and bank tellers of this class and there they remain until the end of the chapter. The rising man must do something exceptional beyond the scope of his special department. He must attract attention. A shipping clerk may do so by discovering in an invoice an error with which he has nothing to do and which has escaped the attention of the proper party. Firm by doubting the adjustment of the scales and having them corrected, even if this is the province of the master mechanic. As a messenger boy, even he can lay the seed of promotion by going beyond the letter of his instructions in order to secure the desired reply. There is no service so low and simple, nor any so high, in which the young man of ability and willing disposition cannot readily and almost daily prove himself capable of greater trust and usefulness, and, what is equally important, show his invincible determination to rise. Some day, in your own department, you will be directed to do or say something that you know will be detrimental to the interests of the firm. Here is your chance. Stand up like a man and say so. Say it boldly, give your reasons, and thus prove to your employer that, while his thoughts have been engaged in other matters, you have been studying for hours when perhaps he thought you were asleep, how to advance his interests. You may be right or you may be wrong, but in either case, you have gained the first condition of success. You have attracted attention. 
Your employer has said that he is not a mere hireling in his service, but a man, not one who is constrained to give so many hours of work for so many dollars in return, but one who devotes his spare hours and constant thoughts to the business. Such an employee must be thought of and thought of kindly and well. It will not be long before his advice is asked in his special branch, and if the advice given is sound, it will soon be asked and taken upon questions of broader bearing. This means partnership, if not with present employer, then with others. Your foot, in such a case, is upon the ladder. The amount of climbing done depends entirely upon yourself, one false axiom you will often hear, which I wish to guard you against. Obey orders if you break owners. Don't you do it. This is no rule for you to follow. Always break orders to save owners. There never was a great character who did not sometimes smash the routine regulations and make new ones for himself. Rule is only suitable for those who have no aspirations and have not forgotten that they are destined to be owners and to make and break orders. Do not hesitate to do it whenever you are sure the interests of your employer will be thereby promoted, and when you are so sure of the result that you are willing to take the responsibility. You will never be a partner unless you know the business of your department far better than the owners possibly can. When called to account for your independent action, show him the result of your genius and tell him that you knew that it would be so. Show him how mistaken the orders were. Boss your boss just as soon as you can. Try it on early. There is nothing he will like so well if he is the right kind of boss. If he is not, he is not the man for you to remain with. Leave him whenever you can, even at the present sacrifice, and find one capable of discerning genius. Our yodding partners in the Carnegie firm have won their spurs by showing that we did not know half as well what was wanted as they did. Some of them have acted upon occasion with me as if they owned the firm and I did, but some airy New Yorkers presuming to advise upon what I knew very little about. Well, they are not interfered with much now. They were the true bosses, the very men we were looking for. There is one sure mark of the coming partner, the future millionaire. His revenues always exceed his expenses. He begins to save early, almost as soon as he begins to earn. No matter how little it may be possible to save, save that little. Invest it securely, not necessarily in bonds, but in anything that you have good reason to believe will be profitable, but no gambling with it. A rare chance will soon present itself for investment. The little you have saved will prove the basis for an amount of credit that is utterly surprising to you. Capitalists trust the saving young man. For every hundred dollars you can produce as the result of hard-won savings, Midas, in search of a partner, will lend or credit a thousand, for every thousand, fifty thousand. It is not capital that your seniors require. It is the man who has proved that he has the business habits that create capital, and to create it in the best of all possible ways, as far as self-discipline is concerned, is by adjusting his habits to his means. Gentlemen, it is the first hundred dollars saved which tells Begin at once to lay up something. The B predominates in the future millionaire. Of course, there are better, higher goals than saving. As an end, the acquisition of wealth is ignoble in the extreme. I assume that you save and long for wealth only as a means of enabling you to do some good in your day and generation. Make a note of this essential rule. Expenditure is always within income. You may grow impatient or become discouraged when, year by year, you float in subordinate positions. There is no doubt that it is becoming harder and harder as business gravitates more and more toward immense concerns. For a young man without capital to get a start for himself, and in this city especially, where large capital is essential, it is unusually difficult. Still, let me tell you, for your encouragement, that there is no country in the world where able and energetic young men can so readily rise as this. 
nor any city where there is more room at the top. It has been impossible to meet the demand for capable first-class bookkeepers. Mark the adjectives. The supply has never been equal to the demand. Young men give all kinds of reasons why, in their cases, failure was clearly attributable to exceptional circumstances that render success impossible. Some never had a chance, according to their own stories. This is simply nonsense. No young man ever lived who had not a chance, and a splendid chance, too, if he ever was employed at all. He is assayed in the mind of his immediate superior from the day he begins work, and after a time, if he has merit, he is assayed in the council chamber of the firm. His ability, honesty, habits, associations, temper, and disposition, all these are weighed and analyzed. The young man who never had a chance is the same young man who has been canvassed over and over again by his superiors and found destitute of necessary qualifications or is deemed unworthy of closer relations with the firm, owing to some objectionable act, habit, or association of which he thought his employers ignorant. Another class of young men attributes their failure to employers having relatives or favorites whom they advanced unfairly. They also insist that their employers disliked brighter intelligences than their own, were disposed to discourage aspiring geniuses, and delighted in keeping young men down. There is nothing in this. On the contrary, no one is suffering so much for a lack of the right man in the right place or so anxious to find him as the owner. There is not a firm in Pittsburgh today that is not in constant search for business ability, and every one of them will tell you that there is no article in the market at all times, so it is scarce. There is always a boom in brains. Cultivate that crop. For if you grow any amount of that commodity, here is your best market and you cannot overstock it, and the more brains you have to sell, the higher price you can exact. They are not quite as sure a crop as wild oats, which never fail to produce a bountiful harvest, but they have the advantage over these in always finding a market. Do not hesitate to engage in any legitimate business, for there is no business in America. I do not care what will yield a fair profit if it receives the unremitting, exclusive attention and all the capital of capable and industrious men. Every business will have its season of depression. Years always come during which the manufacturers and merchants of the city are severely tried years when mills must be run, not for profit but at a loss, that the organization and men may be kept together and employed, and the concern may keep its products in the market. But on the other hand, every legitimate business producing or dealing in an article that man requires is bound to be fairly profitable if properly conducted. And here is the prime condition of success, the great secret. Concentrate your energy, thought, and capital exclusively upon the business in which you are engaged. Having begun in one line, resolve to fight it out on that line to lead in it. Adopt every initiative have the best machinery, and know the most about it. The concerns that fail are those that have scattered their capital, which means that they have scattered their brains as well. They have investments in this, or that, or the other, here, there, and everywhere. Don't put all your eggs in one basket is all wrong. I tell you, put all your eggs in one basket, and then watch that basket. Look around you and take notice. Men who do that do not often fail. It is easy to watch and carry the basket. It is trying to carry too many baskets, which breaks most eggs in this country. He who carries three baskets must put one on his head, which is apt to tumble and trip him up. One fault of the American businessman is a lack of concentration. To summarize what I have said, Aim for the highest. Never enter a bar room. Do not touch liquor, or if at all, only at meals. Never speculate. Never endorse beyond your surplus cash fund. Make the firm's interest yours. Break orders always to save owners. Concentrate. 
Put all your eggs in one basket and watch that basket. Expenditure always within revenue. And lastly, be not impatient. For as Emerson says, no one can cheat you out of ultimate success but yourselves. I congratulate poor young men on being born to that ancient and honorable degree, which renders it necessary that they devote themselves to hard work. A basket full of bonds is the heaviest basket a young man has ever had to carry. He generally gets to staggering under it. We have in this city creditable instances of such young men who have pressed to the front rank of our best and most useful citizens. These deserve great credit. But the vast majority of the sons of rich men are unable to resist the temptations to which wealth subjects them and sink to unworthy lives. I would almost as soon leave a young man a curse as I would burden him with the almighty dollar. It is not from this class that you have rivalry to fear. The partner's sons will not trouble you much, but look out that some boys are poorer, much poorer than yourselves, whose parents cannot afford to give them the advantages of a course in this institute, advantages that should give you a decided lead in the race. Look out that such boys do not challenge you at the post and pass you at the grandstand. Look out for the boy who has to plunge into work directly from the common school and who begins by sweeping out the office. He is the probable dark horse that you had better watch. The End This audiobook is a production of Wealth Books. We hope that you've enjoyed this audiobook. Subscribe to our channel so you will get notified every time we upload a new video.